Welcome to Trauma-Informed Self-Care for Mental Health Professionals, including first responders, uh, substance abuse and addictions treatment providers. I am Louise Sutherland Hoyt, and I'll be presenting today. So you can see my alphabet soup of credentials, and um, I'm a midlife career changer, started in my 40s, and I'm pushing 70 and haven't looked back. So my business is benchmark counseling, consulting, education. The three things on the, that's an AWIN, which is also a surveyor's mark, stands for the Latin phrases past, present, and future. And what we do is we apply the principles that our past is always present. And understanding that those principles will guide our future decisions. So take a moment, you took your ACEs. Did you complete the, um, okay. Just follow along then as you can. So the first thing we start out with is doing a self-assessment. And a self-assessment in this, in this business is really knowing ourselves and learning to be self-aware. Knowing ourselves to the point that when we can anticipate triggers from patients before they happen and we can anticipate and be ready and have a defense or have alternative needs. So you've completed your ACEs and the resilience scale. We use the, I use both of these in my intakes with patients. Number one, the ACEs is one thing, and I've had patients that have scored as many as eight of 10 uh, on their ACEs. But when you cross-reference that with what's called a resiliency scale, then you see out of all the chaos, there are many very important reasons why life for them hasn't been worse because of survival, being able to bounce back, being able to rely on resources. So when you have those complete, just set them aside. So trauma-informed self-care is becoming ubiquitous in the, uh, in the agency level with law enforcement, with probation, with social services. Being from the state of Nevada, Nevada fell onto some very, very bad things that happened that required that the state was mandated by the federal government to re-examine what they were doing with kids and how it is that so many deaths associated with social services was allowed to happen. And what they did was they, after a year or so, is they came up with the idea that, you know, our providers, everyone in the system, must become family-centered, solutions-focused, and be able to utilize identified trauma-informed practices. So many of our patients' experiences are deeply rooted in traumatic experiences. There's been a lot of uh, work and literature on this subject. Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score, is probably the leading resource for anyone who wants to learn about how developmental trauma deeply affects humans as they take this business into their adulthood and fit within an environment that is hostile. So it necessitates a structure of trauma-formed principles around which we build our interrelationships, our practices, not only with our patients, but with ourselves. So here we've got some, some goals. These people are sassy, identified the generation, because it just doesn't stop. So the goal at the end of this, renewed enthusiasm for your work, acquire skills to tool your well-doing program. Doing means action, being able to kind of jump when you want to and feel really good about it as you grow and develop in your work. There are key, well, oops, I, I digress a little too soon. 
And we want to inspire motivation to move toward mental and physical fitness. Physical fitness, uh, nutrition is vitally important in our self-care. We're taking care of all three levels of our pillars. So objectives, refresh current terms and symptoms that are associated with the co-processing trauma. When I say refresh, let's create a new perspective. Let's, let's renew and rethink what terms mean and how they apply to us as we endeavor to grow and keep ourselves safe, keep ourselves comforted, and the ability to interact with our clients on an even keel. So we want to have a process that will help you to engage in, in self-care. The tasks, this is what we are going to do. You take a personal assessment, which is your ACEs and your resilience, and an interactive among, well, it's, it's us. So we'll have a lot of interaction going on. So anytime you have a question, because we don't have a lot of participants here, uh, don't hesitate to raise your arm. Okay, Kim? There'll be questions and answers as we go. And maybe some dumbfoundedness, like what? And if that happens, please feel free to interrupt. So I like to frame my work with my, and my presentations in the context of warriors. Warriors and woundedness. Wars change, warriors do not. We, oddly enough, without our even knowing, are brought up with a certain level of a warrior ethos. And you'll see that my little lapel button reflects a, a Spartan shield with the words one warrior. And there's another analogy that goes with that. We're warriors, and we're wounded warriors, and we're also Wounded, what's the other word that goes with that? Wounded healers, physician heal thyself, mental health person heal thyself. So we have an archetype in Greek mythology. Now here's where you can dust off your high school or college studies about Greek mythology. And our story is about Chiron, Chiron the centaur. There's a nice... N.C. Wyeth kind of painting of our hero, Chiron. He was born out of rape. And he was rejected by his mother, who left him. That was his first wound. And because he was a centaur, keep in mind that centaurs were immortal. And so his woundedness, he would have to the, experience that woundedness forever. And if he's immortal, that's alone forever. He was abandoned by his mother, and he was taken up. And we're talking the higher, highest cadre of gods from Zeus all the way down. And so he was mentored, and he picked up. This is what he gathered from the gods were a sense of fulfilled basic needs, safety, connectedness, and emotional control, keeping his cool. And these, are, oddly enough, are the very same three things that we're born with. We are all born with the need to feel safe, to feel connected, and to feel autonomous. Like we can manage our emotions, we can make our choices on our own, we can speak for ourselves. So, later on in his life, he was wounded by an arrow. He was out hunting with, with Atlas, and Atlas fired an arrow that the tip had been dipped into the blood of the Hydra, and that was forever poisoned, and so he shot in the knee by mistake and sustained a wound that once again would never heal because he is immortal. And so as we go further on, he became known as a wounded healer because he too became a of others. And in his woundedness, 
was able to provide that connection of identity, identification, that connection of safety, and that connected of, even if you're a centaur and you are rebellious, you're behaving like an outlaw out there on the scene, you are acceptable just the way you are as an individual. Can we follow that? So he became a mentor of warriors, and ultimately, for another, he sacrificed his immortality, dying a wounded man, because that was the only means that he was going to be able to end his suffering. So our mental health, as a lesson from Chiron, our mental health is not superior, just as we're, just because we are mental health providers. Our mental health is nowhere near superior to that of the patients that we tend to. It's a mistake. You know, my husband often said, you're a mental health counselor now. How come, what, what's up with, why are you so bitchy today? You know, it, you know we're, we're wounded. So we exemplify healing through our own example of self-examination and reflection. This is a practice that we don't do blatantly when we're sitting down with a patient, but it's something that we model in terms of self-care, visibly setting boundaries with our patients, requiring that they adhere to our boundaries and respect, and we likewise respect theirs. So moving into the next, and segue in, segueing into the next piece of this, the Spartans do not ask how many are the enemy, but where are they? So when we, when we think about the enemy, our patients are facing and our own enemies, we want to ask where where are they, not how many? So, in the case of developmental trauma, we know that those traumas are stored in the midbrain, the amygdala, and they are driven by the brain stem, which has a radar that's on alert, scans a horizon for danger and alerts the center brain when danger is immediate. The thing is, we've got a third brain, this part up here, the executive CEO, that's supposed to be saying, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. That was yesterday. Um, you're safe now, we're, we're, we're cool, we're good. So when we have been traumatized, and our patients, and we know our patients have, we know where those trauma enemies reside, right in the middle of the brain and in the reptile brain, and that's where they will stay. And you know those experiences never go away. So studies show that there is a substantial correlation between mental health providers and adverse childhood experiences. So if you look at your ACEs, and you don't have to disclose the score, where are your enemies? Where would they be located? Who are they? And where are they? And where do they come from? So what is your score? Well, I'll tell you. Here's some, here's some interesting news. There's quite a number of studies. I focused on this one because it really is a valid representation. 64% of mental health care providers who were surveyed here scored at least one. Now, if, you, if that one score was, I grew up with an alcoholic or two in the family, can you imagine just that one thing and all of the other encompassing sources of chaos that arise out of having at least one alcoholic parent? And the skills that were learned in order to feel safe when you're in the presence of chaos. So 53% scored two or more, 15 of us scored four or more. Family history is an indicator. Substance abuse in the family was the most common reported by those of us who are providers. 34% of 
family member with depression or other mental illness was up there. And looking at your own and looking at mine, mine was replete with substance abuse and depression. And it was not only that, the depression and the mood, swifts, chain, mood swings that go along with having untreated anger problems. So we have personality traits, coping styles. In order to be able to take a look at how we manage our ACEs, first thing we do is we, we need to know ourselves and know our strengths. And as we talked about earlier, when you give an ACEs and you offset that with the resiliency, you see that often your strengths outweigh your enemies often outweigh, and we've never really been instructed as how to plug in to our positive traits, our strengths, and our skills. And so part of this, what we're learning today, is, is gives you an opportunity to say, well, I didn't know that that was important to have. Like support. I did not know that having a one or two very close friends was considered a resource. I didn't have a lot of friends. It takes a, you know, a good long time to forge close relationships. But when I do, those are an immense source of strength for me, trusting someone to give me feedback. So looking at your own resilience score, what amazes you, Kim, about that? I think I was, by looking at all this and comparing it to this basis thing, I just feel like I was a huge survivor. And so today, I'm, that's what I am. I guess what I'm You're surviving. There's a lot of good reasons why your life, you know, didn't get worse when it could have. Yeah, thank goodness, you know, because I, I always said I had the best of both my parents, so that's how I You know, we are not taught to latch on to those things because if we grew up in a family that was chaotic, there wasn't a lot of ability to reinforce the We just did it and we know that it helped us get through and to, except to the point where it begins to interfere. So you're pretty resilient, aren't you? you know, you've got a big bounce back factor. I used to think I did well on things I can't do anything about, but I, do, I think I do more than I Oh, yeah, I marked that was my one of my weaker ones. That was my weakest one. Because I, I think that I'm just equating, that's why I asked you about uh -huh. So this is I'm equating it to even today. So, you know, I, I do, but I, I do reflect on it, and I do talk myself through it and wonder. You know, the past is present, it's right there, it's present in the room, no matter where we are now. I'd rather get into it and um, get it done and solve it, and then I have a piece of any price father and, uh, and ignore everything brother, I don't want to hear it. You know, so it's like very difficult for, and I'm not very difficult, I can't do anything about it. Right. You know? So, you know, what... Yeah. Why is it, though, that we both, for example, in that particular question, discovered that that is an issue, that, you know, that... Yeah, it's still... What, what poses that? What, what prompts that? That... That dwelling. That dwelling. Well, you know, these are... Let me get the, see if I can give the Reader's Digest uh, layperson term. As we accumulate traumas, you know, no matter what the level, no matter how severe, how dis distressing. Oh, look at their bird, it just landed right there. Oh, it's a pileated woodpecker. It's a woodpecker. They see their shadow and they want to, they attack. They flirt, are you flirting? And then they bang in the window and uh, they I know, I, I had a bunch of them living behind me in one of my places I lived in in Naples. Really? Oh my God, 
So let's pause for a moment. Let's, this is a great opportunity. Let's press pause for a moment. For a moment, for just a moment, when you recognized that we had a pretty dynamic bird out there. They're magnificent. What was the, what was the experience in your body? Well, seeing its wings just be free, you know. Where did you like, feel that in your body? Yeah. If you could, it, where, where? I was excited. I was, where, where did you feel that in, in your body? Stomach. In your gut. Yeah. Okay, what were the, the thoughts that came to your mind as you look at it? Well, first of all, I thought it was very pretty, and then I saw it flying into the window. I thought it's going to kill itself. <laughs> so, what are the messages? We're talking about some heavy stuff, and yeah. along this guy comes. It's healthy. So how does it, what was the emotional shift for you on that? Uh, in a sense, what I just said about my family is sort of like I'm ignoring it now and I'm looking at something beautiful. Squirrel. Yeah. And you know, there's, that's okay. That's really okay. Except, you know, when, to the point that it interferes. You know, if it's interfering like your brother seems to be ignoring everything, if it gets in the way of Le, you know, playing on a level ground, then it's a problem. But yeah. look, we, we turn a distraction into a teaching moment, a teachable moment. So why is it that old experiences that we retain those? Okay, I'm going to ask you to come back, yeah. and he's, he's going to have his fun and go where he needs to go. So why we retain these images? And it's not that we've got that these are tied to any particular instances, but the effect. The effect consists of the messages. Something happens, we get aroused, somebody says something, somebody does something, a gesture on the road, you get cut off, something happens. And the brain, this remember the brain stem, that's the reptile brain, says, ah! and you get a jolt in your body to some level or another. And then the middle brain, the animal brain, leaves through its policy and procedure manual and says what your reaction is supposed to be. So when somebody, if I give you like a look like this, you know, your middle brain has retained a quick lightning like memory of what you're supposed to do in that context. And it's, it's not conscious, it's totally immeasurable, not observable, but this happens when we are triggered. If we're in a clinical office with a patient, and for instance, if I'm sitting with a known perpetrator of domestic violence, sexual perpetration, and I am revolted, the ability to be able to be calm in that presence is essential. And I need to be able to, because that triggers old stuff that comes up. So as a therapist, I need to be able to manage that. As an ER responder, whatever population that you're working with, some stuff comes up for you, as we will see. And there are ways, there are key ways to develop a behavior or a plan that will help you to distract yourself and say, what well, Becker? Did, I, did that help answer your question? Yep. You sure? Yep. All right. So you know where your strengths are. Surviving. You know, there are a lot of reasons why we're not dead yet. It's because we know how to survive. So we conclude that as a group, we're vulnerable to the negative effects of working with our population. They come from a broad range of cultures, backgrounds, generations, life experiences, families, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the Middle East, China, Orient. So we're vulnerable to the negative effects that are projected onto us by our patients who have experienced immense maltreatment and neglect. In agency and residential settings, this is particularly true. We know that's true because 
if the staff are not behaving and interacting in a trauma-informed manner, respectful of boundaries, aware of postures, aware of language, aware of facial expression, that gets projected back and forth between the population being served and those who are providing the services. And we often call this, this is a culture, an agency culture. And you see it if you go to an agency that's not engaged in some sort of trauma-informed practice, you will see that this chaos mounts and builds upon one another. Then staff get fired for doing unethical things, interactions with patients. So let's differentiate. We have post-traumatic stress, which is catastrophic. You're in a plane crash. You're in a terror, terrorist attack. You are in an automobile. You something. So this is catastrophic. It's natural or human-made disaster, such as combat, rape, physical assault. Then what we have are complex and developmental trauma. And this is, once again, the accumulation of effects of growing up in chaos in a home where there was neglect, there was abuse, there was inappropriate boundaries, sexual abuse, things. So post-traumatic stress is definitely delineated in the DSM. Complex trauma is implied, and though for whatever reason it was not included in the DSM-5. We have Situational flashback, which is directly related to the catastrophe, as such as a combat veteran being having flashbacks associated with seeing his buddy blown up by an IED. We have longitudinal flashbacks, and those are generalized. Those are like we know there's there's this burning in the gut, and we don't really know where it came from. We just know that it's profound, it's real, and we don't really quite understand it. We just know that in the work environment, it can be really problematic. So there are other terms, compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, stress, and vicarious trauma. These kind of things have become interchangeable because the definition of vicarious trauma has, you know, has some hard to measure criteria. So if we look at compassion fatigue and burnout, it's featured in the lit liturgy as a generalized form. It's like what happens when you over-identify, over-empathize, over-relate with your patients. Usually when you're new in the profession, you're more likely to experience this stuff because you're, you're not really savvy to how you can be played and you get you, you do more work than the patient does. It's cumulative and it's observable. So for example, you might find yourself processing feelings of unworthiness with your supervisor when a very adoring client has given you a gift. I'm just kidding. I'm not worthy. He brought this and I just, I'm just not worthy. Okay, no whining. Seriously. You are appointments. You're relieved if a client Cancels is scheduled, over self disclosing, telling too much about yourself, over investing, with no return, blaming the client. Why aren't you getting better? I'm giving you all this stuff, and you're, 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 you're not getting better. You're supposed to get better, and you're not. And labeling the client. Uh, she's a borderline. What do you expect? Uh, he's a sociopath. What do you expect? You know, I can't do anything with this. He's in denial. What do you expect? And you know, these are symptoms, these are clues that you just need to rearrange and take a break and get readjusted. So you become, get lax in keeping up with the latest information. Secondary trauma stress, knowing about the client's traumatic event. This is a stretch. This is a real stretch. Helping or wanting to help the client 
over-investing once again, over-empathizing. The symptoms uh, and signs are similar to compassion fatigue and burnout. There's, we see an increased vulnerability with childhood trauma history. And the effect can be offset, as we, as we noted, with supported uh, support peers and supervisors. You know, like a step up. And once again, it's really, it's really hard to envision. Therapeutic boundaries are compromised. Anger, because your client is not responding to your idealized method of treatment. So you're either avoidant of or you're intrusive of clients' traumatic experiences. Get into detail. We see this with individuals that that want to engage in uh, exposure therapy. And unless you're really experienced in that, it's, uh, you know, it does make things work for our, our patients. So pressure is our client to do more than what they're ready for. It has to be footwork. Our patients to be healed now. So bear in mind, we don't have an instrument that really can assess various trauma. So we fail to meet it. We have to manage how we reconnoiter our inherent risks of our work, how we engage the enemies that reside in our head, and what we do to be well bodied in spirit. This requires knowledge of our enemy's whereabouts where, that we've identified as midbrain, brainstem. And brainstem is the lookout, is the scout. Amygdala is the policy and procedure manual. The CEO, the exterior brain, the human brain, is supposed to mitigate what the others are doing. Understanding the nature. Where are they coming from? What is the nature of our enemy? Growing up in an alcoholic home and in a home where one parent had considerable anger issues, understanding the nature of that, that affected my ability to feel safe. And I had a habit of walking around on eggshells and of taking this into my work before I got into mental health counseling, even then to a degree. So. We, it's required that we develop a strategy that requires our ability to know ourselves and to be able to form a plan that will get us in and out of the office safely, feeling okay about ourselves and not harming our, our patients. So you know your risks and you know your assets. So here's a definition I really like. What we do to establish and maintain health and to prevent and deal with illness. Very simple. Encompasses hygiene, nutrition, lifestyle, environmental factors, socioeconomic factors. And that was from the WHO. That represents a broad range of cultures, doesn't it? Imagine all cultures looking for the same thing. We have a model. So what we have, we're drawing on a mixed bag of old and new concepts. EMDR, trauma informed, I'm an EMDR therapist. I found that this is incredibly useful as an intervention tool. We have good, solid cognitive principles that we engage ourselves in. We have elements of William Glasser. Um, Choice theory, classic Glasser. His, his theory, basic theory, is that you know we, he lists five basic human needs that we all have. I model that down to three, safety, connectedness, freedom of choice. So we all have those. A dose of sin to go in our thinking. And we have archetypes, which we have met Kiran the the Sun Tower and a heaping of John Medina. Are you familiar with John Medina at all? He wrote the book uh, Brain Rules and he is an educator that 
a lot of research on styles of human learning. And in one of his chapters, he expounds the need for humans to keep moving. We were evolved in a state of constant motion. The best meetings would have us walking so many steps at a time. So let's get started. We have three pillars of trauma-informed care that we've gone over before, safety, connectedness, managing emotions. We have so three pillars. We have four elements of direction. Increase your self-observation, your ability to step back from yourself and look within objectively without emotions, but to be able to connect objectively. Use your cognitive abilities. We're in this business because we've got some, some stuff on the ball. We are able, we've got the ability to create insight and benefit from self-knowledge and what others us. Engage in emotional self-care behaviors, especially becoming fit. When you feel the burn of a little emotional agita, apply these principles. Five principles. We have the three pillars. We have the four elements of direction. Now we have five principles of the wounded healer. These are principles to keep in mind. They are what needs to be looked at when you your ability to observe yourself and be, be mindful. Be aware that when you are aroused, when those, those thoughts come up for you at the level of distress they are, understand that the past, this is your history, the past is always present. It's right here in this room. It's right here in our interactions. It's right in the office. It's everywhere. You can pretty much see your past in your interactions with others. Here's the other thing, though. Your past, our past is subject to change. How can that be? How can that be? Yeah. What else? Our past is subject to change. Some life-altering event? Absolutely. Does that really change what the history? Does that actually change what happened in, the, in our history? What changes? All right. We can alter the way we see it. We can alternate. We can alter our perceptions. And this is the work that we do in EMDR and other trauma work, is we, through bilateral stimulation, we're able to help a patient actually process that wad of nastiness and chaos growing up by facilitating a bilateral experience so that it becomes both sides of the brain does their, are able to do their jobs and integrate that experience so that it's like, yeah, you know, that happened. That was unfortunate. Today is now. It's safe, you know. And it's like these things will come at us as if it were a billboard on a road. That's the idea for taking care of business. So guess what? Not only is the past present, we experience people and events not as they are, but what? As we are. What do we call this? Begins with the letter P. Bro projection. Projection. Give winner winner chicken dinner. So it's, it, this is projection. We we project our beliefs on to our inner circle, our outer circle, right here in this room, and especially with our clients because they're doing the same thing. They're projecting what they, their worldview, what their stuff is directly onto us. You know, I call that a gift. When I'm sitting down with a patient and they begin coming at me with 
all kinds of stuff. I'm going, this is great. Who's he talking to or she? And now we're at something. Now we can roll up our sleeves and do some business. When we see ourselves as triggered, what a great opportunity for you to be able to sit down, take five minutes, take a look at where's this coming from? This is an enemy. Where is it coming from? Where is it? So once again, the fourth principle, mindfulness of the present, being fully present in the here and now, is our pathway to managing future events. Being able to be connected, truly practice being in the here and now. We call that mindful presence. It's an essential skill. It's actually the literature and Scientific American says, boy, if you want to re manage relapse a lot better, teach patients the skill of mindfulness and presence. Be able to take five minutes and just press pause and regroup. That's the first best relapse management skill that we could possibly give to our patients. Five, fitness of mind and body. Got to have it. We, our brains require, our brain cells require oxygen for us to think clearly, to be able to facilitate insight, be able to move, to be able to be open, to function, to orient our tasks, to observe ourselves more clearly. So we have three pillars, four elements, five principles. So principle number one, we can actually, we talked about this, so we'll go through that briefly. Reconstructing our past by examining what we're doing in the present. And you can source that in RICO. That's a great book, by the way, The Past is Always Present. In what areas do you blatantly or maybe a little more subtly experience your own history as it unfolds in either your family or your work environment. Every day. <laughs> Can you name a particular, a particular instance that's more likely as not that could trip you up? So when you were asked, turn your cell phone off, put it in your purse, and put your purse under the under the chair. So what came up for you in that in that? Um, well, I have two phones. So the one, my personal phone, I went, okay. Well, I'm concerned because if I get a call from my family, I won't be able to see it. Not not that I would hear yeah. it. Yeah. Turned off. But you won't be. So that reflects. A perception of which of the three? Safety, connectedness, freedom of choice. Um, well, more so, I mean, connectedness for me, safety for my dad. Yeah, yeah. So that's being, you know, in that instant, all of that is indicating that, uh-oh, you know, if, I, if I'm not in contact, if I'm not available right now, the shit's going to hit the fan. Oh, did I say that? Um, and did you have an, just like in that little instant, did you have like a little emotional thing go in there? Because you did. Can you identify it? Yeah, I mean, it just, it was, um, it hasn't, you know, what, what came, like a lot of things came over me. So, uh, you know, they didn't have you around for so long, you're fine, and, you know, it's only an hour, you'll be fine, they'll be fine. Okay, like so, so what, what were the, what's the source? What emotion was the source of those thoughts? What emotion was the source? Um, not being available to them. So, is fear? Do you think fear might be one of those emotions? Or maybe for a second it may have been pain? 
how can I explain this other than I'll say, uh, oh, well, you weren't there and we tried to call you. Yeah, and then so, so that would give guilt, 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 yeah. big, bad, yeah, bad, bad, toxic. So where did you feel that in your body? Not being able to breathe. Here? Right. So you had the, we all experience these things exactly the same way, and we're not aware of it. There's a message. I'm not available. I'm not connected. Uh-oh. They're going to, if something bad happens, they're going to blame it on me. My fault. I feel guilty. And I feel that there's a body reaction. So somewhere in your history, you know, that's, that's your, your history just right there affecting you in the smallest of way with a dadgum cell phone. Go figure. So how does that, does that kind of clear up how past is present for you? Right, and we all respond the same way. When we, when we perceive, and the mind is really bizarre and really kind of na naughty in the, in the way, the messages, that it says, oh, you know, I'm going to feel guilty if they can't get a hold of me. And so we have the belief. Because they don't want any more people in their business. So you're cooking with gas now. So when you when you when you have your quiet moment after you've been confronted by a client, your supervisor, or something, you can go into your quiet little space and say, "Okay, I know where this is coming from." Center. Sometimes it only takes ten breaths, and you know, of course, that comes from another invention. So, so. When we're affected by our patients, it always begins with ancient messages, negative messages that are aroused. I'm stupid. I can't be trusted. It's my fault. The emotions that result from those messages, and we're not aware of it, by the way. We're not saying, oh, well, they're great. And where we feel that in the body. The body retains the memory. Probably we're not aware of it more than any other, any other way of our experience. So we're aware of that, pretty darn aware now. And we identified internal messages. Now there's in the back, uh, as you reference this in the future, there's a list of negative cognitive beliefs. And there's also a list of positive core beliefs. And this is a, this is a tool for you to say, if you're not quite sure what's being aroused, you know, what are the messages acquired in your childhood that were implicit, but nonetheless took hold in a very powerful way, that are driving what you're seeing. So then we see how the messages mutiny. So if we have a, if we have a patient who is a, a victim of um, afraid, and we have a sexual history, that's fertile ground for what? If we're not, if we're not engaged in self-care, transference, transference counter-transference. Yeah. Right, and so if we're, when we become aware of what's going on then we have countermeasures to take, engaging our CEO brain. Now, when people ask me, Louise, am I ever going to get over trauma? I say, you know, the traumas are going to stay with you. They will, they will always be there. Using skills and through a very methodical therapeutic intervention, you can learn to work around them. 
in other words, to be able to see them coming, to be able to bring yourself into the present and continue your walk without even missing a step. So we can't stop the enemies of our past from being present, but we can learn to reshape our histories, which leads us to principle number two, past is subject to change. So I like this quote, and we've been over this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, nothing changed more constantly than the past, especially in when we consider adult development. As we develop to our second adulthood, our third adulthood, we, our perceptions change drastically. We have a predictable crisis that takes place in our early 40s that absolutely turns things upside down. We totally begin to see things differently in question. And so, we rethink our, our histories. When we have a trauma history, it's kind of hard to do that. So we have to take countermeasures. So it's basic CBT. So seeing things not as they are, but as we are. We all think, tend to think that we're objective, but not really. Every time I open my mouth to describe what I see, I'm in effect telling you my history my perceptions. Do you, can you recognize, each, either of you recognize ways in which you've done that? How that, you know, your management style, your interaction style? In what ways do you, can you see that, Kim? sometimes not to uh, have opinion um, about, uh, for instance, I just came up with a first responder yesterday saying, well, we watch the guy, you know, we watch these guys cut the drugs and deal the drugs, and, and I wanted to shout out, and why can't we stop it? Why don't we just go stop it, you know? Because I'm frustrated because, you know, all these people keep dying, you know? And then they just, they, but they go after whoever's purchasing it, after the guy that's, that's, that's taking the money. Mm -hmm. So what comes up for you that's very similar? Think about, in a different way, the same thing happened in a different, in a different event. How, think about, what were the, what were the perceptions? I'm not in control. I don't have... I don't have a handle on this. And that resulted in the emotion of frustration, yeah. anger, yeah. Yeah. disbelief. Yeah. And in your body, once again, yeah. where? In, my stomach. in your stomach. And so notice two totally different situations and the same response. Mm -hmm. Messages aroused, very similar messages about control. And that's one of our three biggies, right? And the emotions, if, when I feel like, when my mind feels that I don't have control, this is what I do. And I have the emotion. And this is how I act that out. And so when we're face to face with patients, we want to really be aware of how, what we're hearing, especially if it's a confrontation. Anybody ever tell you that you suck at your job? Yeah, I get told that by patients, you know, they don't like me. I say, you really suck at what you do. All right, all right, you want to schedule next week? Yeah, okay, let's go. So, we can see, oops, that different situations, different events result in very similar reactions. So, when we become over- empathetic when we become over involved we talked about this earlier what happens we have to engage in self-reflective practices that require us to understand another's point of view so to take ourselves out of the equation we have to be able to comfortably do that and think of their basic needs of what what are their three basic needs safety connectedness, connectedness. 
autonomy. Autonomy, you're catching on. You're catching on. So they have the same basic needs that we do. And as practitioners, we are alert to how not only our, is our mind thinking that our needs are threatened, but how they're being experienced by our patients. Mindfulness of the present. So I coined this quote about pain and suffering. We can actually reroute the effects of emotional and physical distress with and rewire our brains so that we can respond, take care of ourselves in a grounded manner. What questions so far? What stands out is something that you want to know a little bit more about or something even that resonates with you so far? This may not be what you're asking, but when I, when I think of you with a client, I wonder how you don't show reaction or stay, I don't want to say stoic, but how do you not... Because when we have normal conversations, I might have a reaction with a face gesture or, you know, body language or something. How do you maintain that um, professionalism or what's the proper terminology with that client? So they're going to try and read you anyway, but how do you keep that? With practice. <laughs> with practice and good quality supervision. Because, you know, we really have to find our footing. And that takes time, it takes patience, and it takes really great supervision from someone that's been there and that's how we learn. The way I go about it, especially if I perceive that, you know, I have, I have a wonderful woman, huge trauma history, that comes at me every time. You're not listening to me, you're not hearing me. Let me see if I understand this correctly and mirror back. And, and you know, it just, you develop your own style about it. But, and it's important to be able to draw that fine line. And again, it's a skill and it's learned. And I'm sure that in your background that you already have that skill. And it's a transferable one that you bring from the newsroom into the boardroom. Kim, thoughts, questions, something that resonates with you? Getting out of my stomach is hard, I guess. Getting out of your stomach is hard. What's resonating in your stomach right now? What's coming up for you? It just, um, it's where I hold all my, uh, instead of getting it out, I'm a screamer. <laughs> I'm not a, um, it's not that I run from confrontation, but I'm I'd rather think about it before I confront, mm -hmm. so I bottle it all up. Do you think that's a bad thing? Depends on the situation. What, does it, what kind of does situation would that depend upon? Um, well, with a client, you know, you wouldn't want to react without having some thought process going to it. Right. Can you respond? Yeah, by just saying that, I don't want to respond until I have some thought to have well, some thought into it. Okay. Well, if we look at it through these lenses, we can react, which is somebody's in my face, up my grill, and I react with doing whatever I do, either get back up their grill or I run. You know, we fight, we fly, or play dead. We freeze, you know, and this is what, what we do. So in the process of freezing, you know, that's a natural human defense. We do that. And that's what our patients are doing. They're doing the same things that we are, just trying to survive. And so when, if we are freezing and playing dead, are we, is it really stuffing or is it deferring? Deferring, probably more so. And if you were to frame what you are deferring, you know, if you were to frame whatever it is that you're stuffing, does it really matter? And if you, and how does it change things if I, if you say, 
you know, just in the moment, I'm, I, I will defer this and come back to it. How does that change the way you see yourself in as having all of this agita in gut? And you can say that, you know, I really want to do this. And, you know, I can set, I, I'll just do this because my job right now is this. And there's, if you want to go scream and yell and pound sand, you know, yeah, okay. Just think of the empowerment that you give a patient and you give yourself when you say, I can do this on my time whenever I want. Right now I have a job to do. You know, my daughter was in the cab when she was in the Army, and she volunteered for the spur ride. And what that is, is that it's a tradition in the cab that when you earn your spurs, you have to take your soldiers on an overnight march that go through obstacles. And I asked her, as part of doing this trauma work, what is it that keeps you going? What is the message that is at the very core of how you went about getting through and leading your soldiers. She said, you know, the main thing is that I stood up and I said, this is my job. I wanted to run, this is my job. I have people to protect. I have a leadership role. I'm doing this. I could get shot. Anything could happen. Right now, I just have to do my job. And I equate that in the clinical office. We have a job to do. And we have resources, internal resources, that will help us to defer what's going on within us and come back to it. So being mindful of the present is being able to, to say, this, this is, needs to go into a compartment. So does that have a measured response to any situation? Whatever, yes. What do you think? You know, what, would, what could you do if you find yourself in the boardroom and someone might be coming after you or? Well, I had a situation one time when I was with the Real Peace Association and um, there was a board member who was way over the top and somehow I threw a you know, Bible verse at him mm. and that went over the top. <laughs> Now, that was something that probably could have been. It could have been. But I let it out because had I kept it in, would he continue to bombard everybody else with his BS or whatever was going on at the time? So, I mean, that's why I said measured response because I think sometimes you do have to step back and not open your mouth the wrong way. But at the same time, what you're just saying is, there is a way to say it without. And you can be prepared. As again, you know, when we are mindful, when we are measured, we can be prepared for those kinds of situations that come from experience. Getting, you know, somebody up your grill in the boardroom and really degrading. That creates agita that you experience physically and it, it ignites messages. Not good enough. I'm not safe. This is, you know, it's my fault, I feel guilty, whatever it is. And the very powerful emotions, anger, frustration, fear, terror, guilt, shame, all of those. And so being prepared by having a plan and practicing that, practicing the ability to press pause in the moment. There's also a really cool little thing you can do, and I don't imagine you'd do it in the boardroom or in front of a, of a, therap of a patient, but to do what's called a butterfly hug, and that is to tap your knees, go back and forth, and take a breath. Or, if you don't mind how it looks, and I most certainly do, you tap slyly back and forth while breathing and grounding yourself with the breath. It's the bilateral process that enables the brain to, to focus, both sides of the brain, to do their jobs. And that's what this whole business is about. So you can create your own bilateral
processed with what we call this butterfly hug. I use it frequently. So here's the definition. The key is being non-judgmental and removing any opinion about what emotions come up for us. Just being able to observe, to acknowledge, and to be able to gently allow that thought to pass. Nahan says, thoughts are like clouds in the sky. They pass, they come, and they go. The present is forever. And so a thought, imagine that when you're in a clinical office in the boardroom, that a thought that could easily trigger some stuff and interfere with, with the process, just understand this is temporary. This will pass and focus on the tasks before. So we have, we want to make sure that we're connecting with our thoughts, our emotions. Our thoughts are the messages. I'm bad. I can't succeed at anything. I'm a failure. To the emotions that follow, the body sensations, and where they come from. And that, you, you know, you come back to that. When we're mindful, we establish in a relationship with the executive CEO of our external brain and restoring executive functioning. Number five, big fit. So there's a brain doing pumping iron there. So we want to be fit. We're not really connected with the Eastern practices of mind, body, soul practices, but we're getting there. Uh, Validation through research of mind, spirit, and body validates that being mindful and physically fit are interconnected. When we are fit and able to raise our heart rate to a measured level and sustain that for 20 minutes is all we need to do to maintain an alert mind and the ability to establish insight and the, be, the ability to be able to have a more realistic perception. You say, go walk it off, you know, go walk it off. But be purposeful about it. It must be purposeful. It must be the reason I'm going out is that I am going to engage in the sound of my footsteps, what it feels like with my feet, my breath, what I hear in my surroundings. So that's being mindfulness and fit. 35% of the adults in America are obese. We evolved under conditions of almost constant motion. The best meetings would have us walk, even, even this one, we'd be better off if we were walking around at least 1.8 miles per hour. And still more Medina, because I just love this guy. I was uh, on the faculty at University of Phoenix for about five years, and this was more or less his model, is what we adopted in teaching, facilitating a four-hour class. So optimal environment is, would include motion. And that could be in your boardroom, it could be in your session. I took a woman yesterday, very difficult time connecting with her body, incredibly traumatized, very difficult for her to connect with, with pain, any kind of sensation on her skin. And so we went outside, it was hot, and we did very simple things like, you know, as you walk a little faster, how does that change the way you're feeling about yourself right now? How does that change the way you're seeing things right now compared to when you walked into my office? And, you know, the brain here will tell you. She felt she had a smile. It was lively, and she was able to engage in the task that we had set out to do for her session, and that was to develop a connectedness with her body, because she dissociated so much from her presence that it was very hard for her to connect simple tasks. So we have improved executive functioning, reaction times, analytical skills, problem solving, it all speaks for itself. Whenever I find I'm getting in a rut, I look back over the days and I go, when was the last time we went for a good run? And if it's been more than two days, and usually it isn't, I go, well, there, there's my sign. So I, whenever I go and get my heart rate up, I know that problems get, you know, 
either they are rethought, reconfigured, or I come up with a better solution. We want to reduce brain-bound free radicals, which is to toxic waste. Increase in oxygen causes an uptick in mental sharpness. Survival and resistance to damage and stress in the brain. So, to facilitate fitness, soundness of mind, mind, body, and soul practices, I'm going to use myself as an example. Now here, in 2008, I weighed 200 pounds. That was at my 40th class reunion in Bishop, California. And lots of makeup, gaudy clothes, at least they were at the time. 200 pounds. I got a, I got a call from my doctor who says, you know what? <laughs> the bad news is this, and the other bad news is this. So you're a walking heart attack. And so in 2011, 67 pounds lighter, uh, this is me at the summit of Mount Whitney, 14,508 feet. It's a 22-mile range elevation it's the first time in one day. The next year, my other, my therapist friend and I, we did Half Dome in Yosemite, and that required pulling ourselves. So a lot of upper body strength. All of us over the age of 60, by the way, so in 2013, three therapists at the Whitney Summit, all of us, from bilateral of our walking sticks. So this time, three therapists over the age of 60 trudging up and down in 15 hours and 45 minutes. That's rocket, that's rocket speed for a bunch of old girls. So anyway, this is, this is how it happens. It can happen, and it didn't come from telling myself, i got to lose weight. And, um, you know, if I, I really like living. I really like my lifestyle. And I love the outdoors, and I want to be able to enjoy it. And I, this is what I can do to improve that. So if I want to facilitate wellness in my clients, i got to be well. And i got to do stuff that demonstrates. you got to have a core, a constitution. What do I stand for? And how is this a minute? What's the basic core? What do I say? What it remains constant, like our own constitution, amid life changes. And it can be amended at any time. Doesn't mean it changes, it can be amended. You have a mission statement subject to am amendments, and your objectives reflect direction, those four elements. Your tasks are observable and measurable. My task was to eat better, to get in shape, to be in really good shape, and to challenge myself and do this mountain, not one. The backbone of the world wounded here, four elements, self-observation. Cognitive abilities, emotional self-care, and physical self-care. And do this among your, you know, we used to have a wonderful thing in Gloucester when I was working in methadone. We had group super supervision. And we would often go for a walk. We would often give feedback to one another and establish connectedness and support. I would highly recommend that this, this be a practice in many agencies. So here's my goal, based on the three pillars. Have quality relationships, interconnectedness at home, work, and community by creating a safe and sound environment, and through respectful interactions with all. Those are visible, those are doable. I strive to each meet each of the four objectives, constantly observe myself, how I'm, and allow others to tell me their observations. Use my cognitive abilities. I do that best when I'm running or when I'm working out with my heart rate elevated. Emotional self-care. Find a quiet spot. Turn in. 
I like the Tibetan bells, the Tibetan bowls to meditate to more than anything. And I like the way the, the vibrations resonate through my body. And physical self-care. I've gained 10 pounds back since I lost that original 67, and I sure would like to find a way to take care of it. But you know, the adage goes, you can't step into the same river twice. I choose my tasks around knowledge of five principles. Assume the past is present through emotional changes. So assume that. Where's it coming from? Assume the presence of contempt, the absence of whatever when I'm sitting down with a client. I want to wrap this up because I know we're running over. I have met objective number one. I've located my enemy. To locate the enemy, I use my cognitive skills. What mystery does this come from? What is it about? So in order to be able to maximize my cognitive skills, I have to be, I have to be present and mindful of the situation. I have to be fit. And in order to be fit, it only requires 20 minutes every other day. Just 20. Just 20. Changing my history, new perspectives. This has happened a great deal in the last four years since I moved to Florida. So I use, you know, engage in working with others, getting feedback from other supports, um, changing the messages, changing it up with the assistance of bilateral stimulation. I am powerless becomes I am safe. I am, I'm not in control means they've got this. Emotional regulation, I've located, I've engaged, now contain it. So we're aware of our triggers with patients and others. We're aware that if we, that our interactions are driven by emotions and thoughts. And to manage fear-driven interactions, such as the phone and what you're experiencing with your family, is that we really need to be able to be present, we need to be able to move our muscles, and we need to be able to whatever else. Get in my mind, and I can't imagine a time when I'm not gonna be motion moving. Then again, I tend to over overachieve in that area. So find something to be fit and to do it well. A ripple effect happens. You become objective, able to observe yourself, improve cognitive abilities, affect regulation, all of the above. So there's the back of Mount Whitney that is the third pillar over there in the upper left. And this is what it looks like when you're approaching the trailers a mile left. And those look like piles of ships, but uh, that's what it looks like. And whenever I feel like I want to stop, I just envision what that looks like and keep going. So my own personality traits will get in my way. I tend to cut corners. So, so we've hammered these, and I know that I'm running over. So you have your handouts. Trauma-based work, we got to be taking care of ourselves in a trauma-based means. Three pillars, four elements, five principles. So we have found the enemy. Now, as wounded healers, I love this paradox. We can rethink the notion of having an enemy. And this is by Nahan, a Zen Buddhist monk. To love our enemy is impossible. The moment we understand our enemy, we feel compassion toward him or her, and they are no longer our enemy. So transformation and doing mindful work and being present is also transforming our relationship with ourselves, the enemies that are being cloaked in our middle brain become our assets. So, comments and questions?
I'd like to personally apologize if there's only two of us here. Hey, what stand, what, what, what couple of things? Of us. Yes, the there, bird. That, that, <laughs> yeah, look at he's still there. You, uh, we honor your presence. Yes, I believe What, what two things stand out to you as being particularly potentially helpful in the future? Well, understanding my past and and the present, and again, that the past never goes away. The past can change. So I think those are things that stand out for me. Um, and as far as in the work environment, I think it opens uh, compassion towards others and what they're dealing with because, you know, we don't know what's going on in their lives in any given moment. So you, you can't be quick to judge. Right. And so I think this it's, it's been helpful in, in that respect for me. So, uh, yeah, I totally enjoyed it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, what two, maybe three things stand out to you as being particularly beneficial from this presentation? 